Deliverance is the children's bread. Today on Coffee with Con. Winning. Today I found a few scriptures on deliverance. We're going to talk about that today. Um, struggling with stuff to talk about, but this is always, um, you know, it's fun, but it's also very dangerous. We had, if you're if you're part of the prophetic community, you'll probably remember a few years ago, um, there was one time all over the world people were demonically attacked. And uh, in the, it was the night terrors. I got a lot of emails. And I said, well, we're going to have a hangout this week. And that was a, um, man, that was a packed hangout on Google+. Plus. So um, some of the principles that we're going to be talking about today, people need to understand. But this is not something, this is not a game. This is not something that you play with. Um, but I want you to understand uh, some of the, some of the principles, principles behind this. Because being a Christian... In Ephesians 6, you know, this is post-cross. Paul's talking about taking up the, the whole armor of God. We're in a war. We're in a war. A lot of it's in our mind. A lot of it's in our flesh. We're doing a Bible study on Romans, man. There's It ain't just the devil that's out to get us. It's like we have a built-in sin machine that we have to overcome. <laughs> but yes, there is spiritual warfare, and you need to understand the principles. Are you going to go out there without your without your armor and you know to be quite honest we just need to read the word of god we need to get intimately familiar with familiar with the spirit of god and familiar with the word of god if you don't read the word of god and you get attacked you're not going to know what to do so the phrase deliverance is the children's bread it comes from a verse in matthew 15 um 1526 to be specific but jesus is talking to i believe some some versions call it a syrophoenician woman and uh the king james calls it a woman of canaan in matthew fifteen twenty two, and behold a woman of canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him saying have mercy on me o lord thou son of david my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I'm not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said unto her, O woman, great thy faith, be into it, thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that every from that very hour. Now, keep in mind, there's lots of variables in this that we need to understand. This is definitely something that happened pre-cross. And a lot of people make the error that... Just because Jesus said it, that it's in the New Testament. Well, Jesus dealt with the Pharisees a lot about the law, and he was telescoping the spirit of the law, the spirit behind it, through the Sermon on the Mount. And he would, you know, he would say things like, if you look at a woman in lust, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. So he was showing that, you know, while the the law was dealing with the physical aspect of the sin. When you actually committed it, you were punished. But Jesus is saying, you've got a heart problem here. And uh, he says things like, depart from you that work iniquity. Now, depart from you that work iniquity means that people have iniquity in the New Testament. He's talking about they're going to have iniquity that they yield to, right? So deliverance is the children's bread. Well, notice that she is not in covenant. She is not a child of Abraham. Remember how he says to the lady that's bound 18 years, 
lo, this lady whom, you know, she's a child of Abraham, Satan's mounder for 18 years, and he loosed her, right? He appropriated an Old Testament verse. And that's one of the things that we need to understand is faith is believing what God has said and standing on it. In other words, appropriating something, appropriating something that God has said. Have faith in God. If you say to this mountain, be cast into the sea, you know, that implies that God told you to say it first. You don't just speak to the dry bones without God telling you, hey, Ezekiel, speak to those dry bones. You don't just say something be done on the earth. No, let your will on the earth be done as it is in heaven. You don't refuse the one that speaks from heaven. You speak forth what the, the voice from heaven says. Okay, it's not We're not going around like witchcraft Christian cowboys, just naming and claiming it and declaring and decreeing, without prescription from the heavenly realm, from God. So... One of the variables here is the woman from Canaan was not in covenant. And I want you to understand how badly she wanted this demon to be cast from her daughter. Now, I cannot help but go to the to the text where the man says, help my unbelief. Now, we have a similar scenario... And, but it contrasts. Remember, this is the point in Mark chapter 9 where the disciples were sent, in, sent out two by two, and they, couldn't, and they were given authority to cast out demons. And in this one particular time, they couldn't do it. And they said uh, that the, the Father's talking to Jesus, and he says, Wheresoever he taketh them, he teareth them, and he foameth, and gnashes at his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake unto the disciples to cast them out, and they could not. Now notice here that Jesus had earlier given them the authority to do so. He said, you, you can do this, right? And then Jesus says some interesting things that we can take to the bank about contrasting between this Syrophoenician lady or the lady from Canaan and a, a covenant person. He says, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, his spirit tear him, fell on the ground, wallowing, foaming, and he asked his father, How long has it been this way? And he said, Of a child, and oftentimes he cast him into the fire, into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have anything, and help us, have compassion on us, and help us. Jesus said to him, If thou canst believe, now, he says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And the father here, kind of like the Syrophoenician woman, he cries out. He's serious. Lord, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people were running together, he rebuked him. The foul spirit saying to him, now the spirit is a person, it has a personality, it's personified, like we talked in the Bible study, sin is personified. He says, thou deaf and dumb, deaf, dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter into him no more. And the spirit cried, ran him sore, and came out of him. And it, so much so that he said he was dead. Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind comes not out but by fasting and prayer. Now notice here, there's a lot of components. There's a lot of things that contrast between the Syrophoenician woman and then the covenant man. Okay? The covenant man is obviously in authority. You know how the, the man, and I'm not trying to be sexist here, but the man's the authority of the household. With the Syrophoenician woman... We have a couple of strikes against her here. Number one, we don't know if she's married, um, but the parents have authority over the children, right? So he wasn't dealing with the belief of the child. He was dealing with the belief of the, the authority figure in that house. He was dealing with the belief of the covenant man. He's a covenant man from Israel. Um, let's see, I'm trying to read make sure. Well, anyway, Jesus does not, he doesn't say you're not a covenant person, but to the Syrophoenician woman, he certainly does, 
or the woman from Canaan. Now, notice here that before Jesus had charged the disciple, they had the authority pre-cross. Notice this is a pre-cross. It's in the Old Testament covenant. You know, by whom do your children cast them out? They were accusing um, Beelzebub casting out by the leader of Beelzebub, casting out the demons. And uh, who do your children cast them out? So there was deliverance done in the Old Covenant. Okay, so we need to keep that in mind. When we read our scriptures, we need to know which covenant that we are in. Now, the Father here says, I don't believe, help me with my unbelief. And isn't it interesting that Jesus later on says, this fourth can come out but nothing but by prayer and fasting. So for those of you that are serious about being a Christian, this should get your attention. The higher the level, the bigger the devil. Jesus had commissioned his disciples to be able to cast out demons, heal the sick, and raise the dead. Amen? And that, that scripture is in Matthew. It's early on. Um, the, then sent Jesus the twelve fourth commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. Okay, so he's not into the Gentiles, so that kind of shows that this person that we're dealing with is not uh, a Gentile, nor the Samaritans, but go you rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See, salvations of the Jews, you know, every, God was trying to get his lost sheep back into the fold. And in Matthew ten seven, as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven's at him, he says this, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely you've received, freely give. So we can see here that um, that these people had some authority, but they didn't have the fasting and prayer level of authority. And we have a problem. One of the variables is the problem of the Father's belief. Now, Keep in mind, there's also a problem or a variable that we need to understand when we're working with this, that there's a scripture that actually says Jesus could do no many mighty works there because of their unbelief. This is alluded to in a couple of places in the Bible about the same incidents, Mark 6, 5 and Matthew 13, 58. Matthew 13, 15, 7, 13, 57 says, And they were offended in him, but Jesus said to them, A prophet's not without honor save in his own country, in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. See, they didn't believe that Jesus could do this. Now, the the the, the covenant man believed Jesus could do it. He knew he was the Messiah, right? So he had, he had, he was working on a foundation of belief, but there was no prayer and fasting in the disciples. Now, Jesus, if you remember, the disciples may have pr- pr- uh, prayed and fasted, but remember, you can't fast while the bridegroom's with you. That type, Remember that part of the, the Bible? So they weren't in a fasting and prayer mode. They were rejoicing with the bridegroom, obviously. So Jesus was the one that had the fasting and prayer under his belt at this time, right? So, of course, Jesus then at that point was able to cast forth that demon. Now the other girl. And the reason I'm uh, the reason I wanted to focus on the Syrophoenician uh, woman a little bit is because she is not in covenant. Now this is this is pre cross. This is pre cross, and I, I want you've got this has got to play a part in your thinking, and when you pray about it, she was not in covenant. So what was happening here is Jesus, she was asking Jesus to cast a demon out of a non-covenant person. But notice that she's very sincere. She's persistent. She calls Jesus Lord, and she continually, you know, because of our importunity, if we continue, ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. Those are the continuation words in the Greek. We're supposed to continue to do these things. So the lady there, she continued. She didn't quit at the first no. When he was silent, she didn't stop asking. Just like the unjust judge you know, she, he, she wearied him day and night, and finally he gave in. 
That's wrestling with the Lord like Jacob did. He had to wrestle with the Lord for this. She continued continued persisting with Jesus. She called him Lord. Yes, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And then he said to the woman, obviously she was an authority over the child, the daughter, right? The parents are an authority over the, do- over the children. We don't know if she was married or not. And I, I'm going to assume that she was a single parent just for the, it, it seems to fit my thinking. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm right on this, but she had authority and Jesus said, okay, basically you have authority in this situation. You're persisting to call me Lord. And then he cast the demon out. Now this is significant. It says in the old Testament that many became Jews. This will probably blow a lot of people's mind, but this is what the Bible said in, in Esther, 8, 16, and 17, and the Jews had light and the gladness and joy and honor. And in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Remember when John the Baptist, he says, oh, you brood of vipers, you know, who, who warned you to flee the wrath to come, Right? He said, from these stones, I, you know, don't say within yourself, I have Abraham to my father. You know, that's, uh, they were using that as their crutch. They're once saved, always saved. I'm of a child of Abraham. He says, don't say that. Don't say that. These rocks, God can make rocks into children of Abraham. So at this point, we can see that the Syrophoenician or the woman from Canaan became a Jew. Amen. More after this. Hey, this is Amy from Amy Daily, and you are listening to Coffee with Conrad on ConradRocks.net. Hey, Christian artists and businesses. Reach today's Christian music fans by advertising in Live It Loud magazine. Live It Loud magazine features artists such as Jason Crabb, Carmen, John Schlitt, and Sanctus Real. Live It Loud magazine is emailed out to over 30,000 Christian music fans worldwide. Use the promo code Conrad Rocks for 10% off your first full page advertisement. For advertising rates, email Conrad at LiveItLoudMagazine.com. That's Conrad at LiveItLoudMagazine.com. Hey man, I'm bad. glad to be working as an affiliate for Live It Loud magazine. So if you're a Christian business or up-and-coming Christian music artist and you would like some exposure to over 30,000 Christians worldwide, let me know. I can get you some advertising in there. Now, um, we were talking about deliverance. Um, I'm still looking at some scriptures here. I'm commenting on some scriptures that I that I had some notes on. One of the things that's pretty popular in today's teaching, um, I'm not going to chew all your food for you, but I'm going to say here's some food to chew. (laughs) That's what I'm going to do today. But one of the popular doctrines from people that have been in deliverance and from people that I know, quite honestly, is they say, do not cast a demon out of an unbeliever. And I know this is going to blow away a lot of the audience. It is. But and you think, oh wow, that's that's all that's all in the you know, the Bible days. Well guess what? We're in the Bible days. Ephesians six was written for Christians. It was written to the Ephesians, but it was written for us to be able to use. The the whole armor of God, why do you think he wrote that for fun? Amen. Um so one of the things that they say and is to not cast a demon out of an unbeliever. And there's a few there's a few scriptures uh, that we can talk about regarding this. And you know what? Not everybody's going to run across this situation. Um, I have <laughs> ran across it. It's in my book, Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey. I was taken quite surprised when I was praying for someone and they, they began to manifest and you know what, people? I, I'm like, I, I was freaking out, kind of, 
you know, and then God said, you know, you read the Bible, you know what to do, just do what it says. So I was like, wow, okay, I did that. That's why we need to read the Bible. We need to get a personal relationship with God. But I'm going to tell you something interesting here. In Matthew 12, 43 through 45, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through the dry places sinking rest and finds none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he's come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be upon this wicked generation. Now, the last thing there, Jesus says, is this wicked generation. So, according to audience relevance, we need to know that this is pre-cross, and he's talking to the children of Israel right there. He's saying this is the timing that this will happen. So, as a Christian that that we're living in the New Testament, we have to go, well, wait a minute, um, how does this apply to me, right? Because not everything Jesus says is a post-cross idea. So we need to see. We need to see in the future, you know, pap, you know, in the post-cross scriptures, um, if the concept still carries, you know, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses. That's a very good principle for the New Testament Christian to follow. Now, notice. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he doesn't say a saved man, a covenant man, so we just don't know. He walks through the dry places seeking rest, and he finds none. One of the arguments that people use for not casting a demon out of an unbeliever, it's like kicking a person out of an apartment that they've rented. They have the right to be there. Do you understand it's like the person has the right to be there, and then he's going to get angry and come back with some more guys and give you a problem. So that's the concept. You're kicking someone out that has a right to be there. Notice with the Canaan woman, she was non-covenant, but she was seeking God. And, and that plays a part here. Okay, Then saith he, I will return to my house, because it's his house. He's got a right to be there. He's thinking, you know what? I've got a right to be here, and I'm going to get some friends. And then he comes to the house, and he finds it empty. What what the precept there is, is there's no Jesus in it. You know, when Jesus says, I will come in, I'll knock on the door and come in to you in Revelation 3.20. The idea is when a demon comes to knock on your door, you want Jesus to answer the door. In this particular house, he finds it empty, swept and garnished. Then he gets seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they will enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So that is why people say don't cast the demons out of an unbeliever. Is you know, or or if you're casting one out of an unbeliever, be sure that they accept Jesus, like the Canaan woman. Um, now, the seven times concept, a lot of people are like, well, wh- where did this come from? Well, this is an Old Testament principle that God established a long time ago. In Leviticus 26, 18, um, if, let, me, let me pull this up in my Bible. I want to make sure I'm reading it in context here. I'm going to go back a little bit, Levi- Leviticus 26, 15, just to put it in context. And if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul shall abhor my judgments so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you will break my covenant, okay? I will do this unto you. I'll even appoint over you terror, consumption, and a burning og that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. Think of Job. God is allowing the devil to attack Job, right? Um, God allows these things. God is a hedge of protection. We know this from... We just know this from Psalm 91. He's a hedge around us. He's a shield about me. Then he says in 26.17, And I will set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when none pursueth you. Okay? That's the demonic spiritual realm. These spirits just scare the dickens out of you. (laughs) That's what they do. And then he says, Leviticus 26.18, And if you will not 
Yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. So he's given the covenant people here in Leviticus a chance to repent, a chance to come back under the the, the authority of uh, the Father, God. And if they don't, well, he's going to give them seven more times. This is where this precept comes from. Um. So it's very important, once someone is delivered, that they accept Jesus Christ seriously. Um, if you're going out there as a Christian cowboy, just casting out demons because you figured out that you could, you know, um, yeah, you need, to, you need to know this. You need to know that they've got to accept Jesus. And I've had uh, personal experience with people saying, look, yeah, I don't do that unless they're going to be listening to the gospel and you know what? We're going to pick this up tomorrow. I've gone kind of long today, so we're going to pick this up tomorrow. God bless you. If this ministry has touched your life, please check out conradrocks.net. There's lots of good stuff over there. I'm excited. I, sometimes I hang out there. <laughs> anyway, you can check, check out Conrad Rocks News, um, lots of Christian news that I find interesting. I do share it from time to time. And also, if you like these podcasts, if you like one in particular, be sure and share it with your friends. Share it on Facebook, Google Plus, or Twitter. All right? And also consider the support page. Um, this ConradRocks.net is supported by its listeners. Love you guys. Thank you for being a part of my life. Till we meet again, dig deeper. Go higher.